Well, let's turn to A Shot to Die For. We have a reading um, today from the opening chapter of A Shot to Die For, which is Libby's most recent book. Um, and it's the opening scene where um, a woman that Ellie is talking to is shot. With each syllable, the woman's voice slid up the register toward hysteria. I slowed. I was walking toward the Lake Forest rest stop, an oasis we call them here, just off the interstate near the Wisconsin state line. The woman was talking on her cell phone about 30 feet away, but her voice carried clearly. How could you do this to me? After all our plans, you knew I'd be stranded. A man with a buzz cut and horn rimmed glasses stood near the entrance, his hands in his pockets. He stepped aside as I approached. Look, I can't talk long. I borrowed a cell. There was a pause. Mine's out of juice. A tall, striking woman who appeared to be somewhere in her 30s, the woman on the phone wore a white t-shirt, khaki miniskirt, and sandals. Her shoulder-length hair, held off her face by a wide headband and a pair of shades, was a glossy black. Blue highlights glinted when she moved her head. I bought a Diet Coke, eyed the Krispy Kremes, and quickly headed back outside. A Thursday evening in the third week of June, it had been a hot and humid day. Now, though, a cool front was pushing through, and a breeze was chasing away the heat. The woman was still on the cell. I know. I'm sorry, too. I hate it when we fight. There was a pause. I realized that. It's just, well, this has been a shitty day. The man had been standing near the entrance, had his back to her, as though he was trying not to listen to her conversation. I can't. My cell is out of juice she repeated. Okay. Okay, thanks. I'll be waiting. Please come soon. The woman disconnected and looked around. Spotting the man at the entrance, she walked over and handed him the cell. Thank you. You've been very kind. The man pocketed the cell. No problem. I hope everything works out. I'm sure it will, she smiled. Hope you catch some big ones. The man raised his hand and started across to the parking lot. The woman went inside. I looked at my watch. Almost seven. I wondered if Rachel had eaten. Maybe I should go back in and pick up a pizza. For now, though, I lingered outside with my drink, letting the cool breeze wash over me. I was just about to go when the woman came back out, carrying a drink. She walked over to a three-foot-high brick wall that ran between the building and the parking lot. Turning her face into the wind, she lifted her hair off the back of her neck. Feels good, doesn't it, I said. She nodded. It had been hot in Lake Geneva, the breeze that usually keeps things cool, apparently AWOL. For over a century, wealthy Chicagoans had escaped the blistering Midwest summer at the Newport of the West, where they built luxurious estates. Now, though, I was 20 miles southeast, at the only rest stop between the North Shore of Chicago and the Wisconsin state line. Access ramps led from the highway to a paved surface the size of a football field. The building that housed the food court occupied the middle of the tarmac and hung over both sides of I-94. Parking lots flanked with gas pumps sat on both sides. The young woman sighed. I guess it'll turn out okay after all. I looked over. Bad day? You don't know the half of it. I couldn't help overhearing. I hope your ride gets here soon, I said. The young woman tipped her head. Me too. I've lost the whole day. I hate fights. It was stupid. Well, they usually are. It should never have happened. I nodded. The breeze was so refreshing I hated to leave. I slung the canvas bag that doubles as my briefcase onto my shoulder and joined her at the wall. As long as we were both hanging around, I might as well be nice. She perched on top, her legs dangling in front. Close up, she was stunning. Her black hair thick and wavy without a hint of gray, I noted enviously. Her skin olive gold. She had wide jade green eyes, and those legs would pass what my father called the Betty Grable test with flying colors. I pressed down on the tiny web of varicose veins above my knee, willing them to disappear, but they popped back out when I lifted my thumb off my skin. I sighed. What's your name? Daria. She swung her legs back and forth like a kid. I'm Ellie. I scanned the cars heading up the ramp on our side of the rest stop. A silver beamer slowly turned in, followed by a green pickup with a camper shell. 
Is that your ride? I pointed to the Beamer. Daria seemed to deflate. No. I hoisted my bag farther up my shoulder. Well, don't worry. I'm sure your boyfriend will be here soon. She was about to say something when the pickup that had been behind the Beamer passed us. It slowed to a crawl and the window at the back of the camper shell slid open. The movement triggered a prickly feeling at the back of my neck. I turned to Daria. She stared at the pickup. I was about to ask if she recognized it when I heard a loud crack. I whipped around. The pickup's engine revved and it tore out of the ramp. I turned back to Daria. A crimson design exploded on her shirt. She fell forward off the wall and crumpled to the ground. 